Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to our next lecture um, on peripheral vascular disease. Uh, may I invite the moderators for this uh, lecture as well? Uh, senior consultant cardiologist, Dr. Vajira Sena Ratna, senior consultant cardiologist, Dr. Stanley Amrasekara, and consultant cardiologist, Dr. Tanya Pereira, to take the stage, please. Professor George Joseph, MBBS, MD, DM, FC, F, F, FCSI. The topic here is uh, endovascular treatment of aneurysms of the aorta. Professor, you uh, you will be speaking to uh, the council members of uh, Sri Lanka College of Cardiology. Uh, you have uh, more than 1,000 virtual uh, delegates linked into this session, and I expect about more than 2,000 will be listening in groups. And uh, in the audience, you may not see very many because of this COVID-19 pandemic regulations. Uh, we are honored to have you here to deliver a speech. Let me introduce you. Uh, professor uh, is a professor, Cardiology Unit 1, Department of Cardiology, Christian Medical College, Vello, South India. Editorial Board Member, Journal of Endovascular Therapy. You are not a stranger to us. You have addressed us in February, 9th of February, in Colombo. Unfortunately, we could not continue those discussions. I appreciate your presence. I invite you to start your speech. Uh, thanks right. for this invitation to talk to the Sri Lanka College of Cardiology. And in the next 20 odd minutes, I'll take you through a tour of endovascular treatment of aortic aneurysms and uh, dissection. We'll start with the abdominal aortic aneurysm, which is the commonest uh, site for aortic aneurysms. And the principle of treating this is to place a bifurcated graft in the uh, abdominal aorta starting above the aneurysm below the renals and then uh, adding on two limbs into which go into the main body which is in the aorta and uh, in this way the aneurysm is excluded from the flow of blood and it progressively thromboses and shrinks. So here's a, a, the first major uh, randomized trial that compared endovascular repair of aneurysms with open surgery and it showed that uh, this technique was had the same uh, all-cause mortality and aneurysm mortality over the um, following eight years of the study. So they are essentially almost identical in their outcomes. Here's an example of a case of an intrarenal aneurysm which we treated with a bifurcated endograft. And uh, two special features of this case were two iliac aneurysms. Uh, on the left, you can see a, a right common iliac aneurysm. On the left, you can see a left internal iliac aneurysm. Both of these were also treated in the same sitting using parallel stent grafts that went into the iliac limbs. And this was the result after exclusion of all those aneurysms. And this is the follow-up CT angiogram showing continued exclusion of the aneurysm and uh, good flow through all the stents. This is another example of an aortic, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm with bilateral common iliac aneurysms, also treated with uh, a parallel stent grafts. And here you can see the deployment of these parallel stent grafts. The internal iliac stent grafts are deployed using a brachial approach. And this was the final result showing exclusion of the aneurysm and preservation of flow into the internal iliac arteries. At follow-up, we found what is known as an endo leak, that is contrast entering the sac of the aneurysm. And this one was a type two, where it comes in through a side branch and exits through another side branch. And we were able to enter this with a long needle, keeping the patient in a prone position and did an angiogram. And you can see the flow of contrast through this endo leak. Following that, we injected cyanoacrylic glue and completely occluded this endo leak to, and you see a cast of this uh, uh, glue in the endo leak. And at follow-up, you'll see this glue as very bright uh, white material in the uh, sac of the aneurysm. And uh, so from 2015 to 16, you can see the uh, endo 
endovascular repair that we have done. And uh, in 17 and 18, you can see the repair is still good, but you can see the size of the aneurysm uh, sac is shrinking and uh, there is calcium in the wall of the sac. So that gives you an idea of the extent of the sac. We'll move on to the juxta renal uh, aorta. Juxta renal aneurysms, by definition, are those which extend right up to the renal arteries. And uh, there is no proximal neck where you can land an endograft and get a good seal. So there are two techniques to deal with this. One is using chimney grafts, and the other is using fenestrated grafts. So these chimney grafts are also known as parallel grafts. And uh, if they point upwards, we call them snorkel or chimney. If they point downwards, they're called periscope. And uh, if they are uh, sandwiched with another uh, stent graft within a, a main uh, endograft, then you call it sandwich. And we saw a couple of examples just before this. So this is what a chimney graft would look like, where we put covered stents into the two renal arteries and start the repair above the level of the renal arteries at, at the superior mesenteric level. So this is an example of a large aneurysm with a very poor proximal neck. And uh, we use this chimney graft technique. There are two sheets coming from the two brachial arteries going into the two renal arteries. And uh, we deploy the aortic endograft and also simultaneously deploy covered stents into the renal arteries. And this was the result we got uh, after we completed the procedure. The aneurysm is excluded and flow into the renal arteries is preserved through these chimney grafts. The other technique to deal with the juxtarenal aneurysms is to use fenestrated grafts. And we've been working on on-site fenestration of aortic endografts. We have our own fenestrators, which we have developed uh, in-house. And uh, these are circular fenestrators and we heat them over a flame and touch uh, the graft at the point where the fenestration is to be made. And you get a circular hole in the graft material. And then we line the edges with uh, radio opaque wire, suture down with 6-O-proline, uh, and then we uh, resheat the graft. And this was published seven years ago. So here's an example of a fenestrated repair of a juxtarenal aneurysm, a patient who had come with uh, uh, this kind of anatomy, very ugly looking, a lot of calcium, and the neck is very complex and not suitable for a uh, intrarenal repair. So this is the graft we used, uh, endurant graft uh, with three fenestrations, one for the superior mesenteric and uh, two for the renals. And then uh, we also constrain the graft with a external uh, fibroproline uh, suture, which we break by inflating a balloon on the inside after we have cannulated the fenestrations. So this graft is uh, deployed and uh, to, uh, to know where are the side branches, we pre-mark the three target uh, vessels using uh, the left groin. And from the left groin, we, we put in a 12 or 14 F sheet and puncture the valve uh, three or four times and pass four French catheters through each quadrant of the valve and mark the uh, target arteries which you saw in the previous uh, slide. And then we deploy the endograft and orient the fenestrations towards the target arteries. And this is the result we got. Uh, through the fenestrations, we have deployed uh, covered stents and lined them with uh, bare metal self-expanding stents for extra radial strength. So uh, this is uh, a plain fluoroscopy showing the three fenestrations and the stents that we have uh, put in them into the three target vessels. And uh, the fenestrations are those black circles because you see them because there's this radiopaque wire lining the edges of the fenestration. So this was the follow-up result. Uh, the aneurysm is excluded and uh, we have uh, preserved flow into the renal arteries and the superior mesenteric artery. And uh, on the right, you can see the CT angiogram with the complete thrombosis of the sac and uh, flow through the two limbs of the bifurcated endograft. So fenestrated repairs are generally better than chimney repairs. They have less mortality, less endoleaks, less renal adverse events. But chimney repairs are uh, quicker. They have less fluoro time, less contrast volume, less blood loss. So how do you decide between the two? By and large, fenestrated repair is preferred in routine cases. 
but in complex anatomy and urgent cases, we would use chimney uh, repair. We'll move to the descending thoracic aorta now. And uh, this is also a good area to do endovascular repair. The endo graft spans the length of the aneurysm and excludes it. So here's a typical descending thoracic aortic aneurysm, which was uh, containing a lot of thrombus. Uh, so the size is actually much bigger than the 3D reconstruction uh, image. And this is the plain uh, angiogram. And after we deployed two overlapping endographs, we have completely excluded this aneurysm. And at six months follow-up, the aneurysm remains excluded. We also treat thoracoabdominal aneurysms, which uh, move from the thoracic segment into the abdominal segment. And there are five types. All five types can be treated by endovascular technique. I will show one example where we used what are called cuffed fenestrations. So this is a very complex thoracoabdominal aneurysm, which has two right renal arteries marked by the blue arrows. And then you have the celiac and the SMA, pink and green arrows. And also we have two internal iliac arteries taking off from internal, I mean, common iliac artery aneurysm. So we have to uh, exclude a very long segment of the aorta and the iliac arteries, and we must try and preserve the internal iliac arteries so that spinal cord blood supply is not compromised. So we made uh, two fenestrated graphs on top. Top two images is the aortic endograft, which has uh, uh, five uh, fenestrations, two for the right renals, and one each for the ren left renal, SMA, and celiac. And then we made uh, two iliac limbs, which have a single fenestration each. And you can see all these fenestrations have small cuffs. And we have also wired these fenestrations so that it's easy to cross the fenestration into the target artery. As you can see here, catheters that ride up these uh, precannulation wires cross the fenestration and then you can pass a parallel wire into the target artery. So this was the completion angiogram, which shows uh, exclusion of the entire thoracoabdominal aneurysm and preserved flow into all these uh, uh, seven uh, fenestrated vessels, the two right renals, one left renal, SMA celiac, and the two internal iliacs. And this is the follow-up CT angiogram showing a continued good result. And on the right, you can see the fenestrations are flowing and the aneurysm sac is thrombosed. So cuffed fenestrations are an alternative to branched endographs, which was uh, what people used in this situation earlier. And they can be made very easily on the table using surgical PTFE graft. And they provide a great seal and they're good for uh, side branches which take off from the aneurysm sac. And these branches could be pointing upwards, downwards, sideways. It doesn't matter. This technique works for all of them. And this uh, technique was reported earlier this year by us in the journal Vascular. We'll move to aortic dissections now. And uh, we'll start with type B aortic dissections, which is a very good area for endovascular repair. And the principle behind it is to close off the entry tear of the dissection. So usually there will be an entry tear just beyond the left subclavian artery. There may be more down the line. And so you place an endograft across that and that will lead to thrombosis of the false lumen. And it's good to cover as much of the aorta as possible. Usually we cover all the way down to the celiac artery because the extent of false lumen thrombosis is usually matching the extent of true lumen coverage that you do with endografts. But there is an issue. Sometimes there may be a retrograde flow up the false lumen from the abdominal aorta, and this blood may then exit the false lumen through a number of uh, lumbar or intercostal vessels. So that will keep the false lumen patent and prevent it from thrombosing. So to prevent this, so there is now a technique called the candy plug technique, which you, uh, this is a pan candy plug commercial on the right side. You deploy that in the false lumen lower down so that this upward flow cannot occur. We make candy plugs ourselves using a, a Cook a TX2 endograft, which has only three stents and we constrain the middle stent and deploy it in the false lumen. And then after you remove the delivery system, you place an Amplax vascular plug in the middle segment to close it off. So that is effectively a candy plug 
similar to the commercial one. So this is a type B dissection, which I, I would like to show you, a hypertensive patient, acute chest pain, and he had right lower limb weakness with absent pulses. And the right uh, common iliac was occluded by the intimal flap of the aneurysm. So the first thing we had to do was to open this occlusion and put a stent into the right iliac artery and restore flow down the right lower limb. Then we did a thoracic endovascular repair with a endograft which has a single fenestration for the left subclavian artery. So the repair starts from the carotid artery and goes down and there is a fenestration through which a small fenestration stent has been placed in the left subclavian artery. And there was a false lumen in the subclavian artery which was flowing retrograde into the aortic false lumen. So we had to put in some coils there from a brachial approach to close that off. So this was the final result. After all this was done, the false lumen is excluded. And on the right, you can see the follow-up uh, follow uh, CT angiogram showing a preserved uh, good result over a period of uh, three months. Now, there has been this study called the INSTEAD trial, which shows that at, when you randomize and compare uh, endovascular repair to optimal medical therapy, over a period of uh, six years, uh, the uh, all-cause mortality in the endovascular group remains steady after the first year, whereas in the optimal medical therapy group, it keeps rising. The same with uh, aorta-specific mortality and the same with uh, progression of disease um, and adverse events. So it is, uh, the, the study showed that survivors of type B aortic dissection, uh, endovascular repair is associated with good uh, improved survival and disease progression compared to optimal medical therapy. So in stable type B dissection with suitable anatomy, endovascular repair should be considered to avoid late complications, which means like almost all cases should be treated. We'll now go to total endovascular repair of the aortic arch. And uh, we have made our own technique for this, which has four important components. One is to transpose the anatomy of the aortic arch branches onto an endograft. And second is to resheat that endograft without any twisting, and then deploy it with two kinds of accuracy. One is rotational orientation, and the other is axial positioning. So if the rotation is has to be accurate so that the fenestrations are oriented in the right angles. And axial is also important so that uh, they don't go too far in or too far back. And then once you've got this correct position, you completely deploy the graft in one go. So we'll look at an example. Here's a type B dissection where the uh, post subclavian repair is not possible because the dissection starts right at the subclavian and the aorta is, uh, there is no landing zone near the subclavian. So we have to start in the ascending aorta. And so we look at the aorta from the superior aspect in the direction of the blue arrow, which is perpendicular to the takeoff of the three arch branches, which is the yellow line. And when you look at it that way, you see these three uh, origins of the innominate left carotid and left subclavian. So we mark it on this image and draw an imaginary color clock line, that is the red line. And then we transfers, uh, transpose this relationship onto an endograft, which you see lower down. And the same relationship is now on the endograft. And then we resheath it and we put two figure of eight radiopic markers on the color clock line. So, and we bring them up on the surface just under the endograft cover so that you can see the stellar clock line through the uh, endograft cover. And you can also see it radiographically. So when you resheath, we uh, tie down each segment of the endograft with uh, two of proline. And then as we resheath, we remove these uh, sutures. And there are these welds along the endograft, which are the yellow arrows. And these welds must all be in a straight line. So if they are in a straight line, then you know that the endograft is not twisted, which is very important, so that the fenestrations don't spin out of uh, their orientation. So we use that figure of eight marker to orient the delivery system. This, this figure of eight marker should look like a straight line as you go in. So when you open out the arch, this figure of eight marker should be on the outer curve. 
looking like a straight line. So then you know that the fenestrations are oriented correctly. So first thing we do is to find the plane of the arch, which is the plane in which the ascending and descending aorta overlaps. So this wire in the ascending is overlapping the same wire in the descending. So that if that was RAO 30, then the working view is LAO 60, orthogonal to that. So in LAO 60, take the delivery system in and these figure of eight markers should be looking like straight lines as you see with these yellow arrows. And then when you are in position, the, the left carotid fenestration should be ahead of a wire in the left carotid artery. The wire is marked by the green arrow and the left carotid fenestration is marked with the yellow arrow. So once that, uh, that is correct, so then axial orientation uh, position is also correct. So once you've got rotational and axial orientation correct, we deploy the endograft. And then we cannulate the fenestration and put stents into them. So this was the final result. And uh, in this case, the lower end of the aneurysm was filling from large uh, uh, true false communications in the abdominal aorta. So that was not uh, uh, acceptable to us. So we did a further repair in the abdominal aorta with another fenestrated device with four fenestrations for the celiac SMA and the two and the two renal arteries. And this was the result after the additional uh, endovascular repair in the abdominal aorta, which linked to the repair above. So this was the final follow-up angiogram. You can see a good result and the entire dissection has been repaired. Now, this is the last case perhaps uh, a type a dissection which has had ascending aortic replacement but now the remaining aorta needs to be repaired and you can see the surgical repair has dealt with the ascending aorta but the rest of the aorta is uh, badly dissected and the false lumen is really big the left kidney is shrunken the left renal artery is coming off the false lumen and so this is the CT. You can see the true lumen is squashed in the descending aorta. The false lumen is big, partially thrombosed. And this is the extent of the surgical graft which has been put in. So we need to start from the surgical graft and go all the way down. So we used a fenestrated endograft with three fenestrations for the three arch branches. And then we used the same delivery system with that figure of eight marker telling us about rotational orientation. So after deployment, we put three stents through the three fenestrations into the three arch branches. And we also put a candy plug in the descending aortic false lumen to close off the false lumen from below. And the subclavian had a false lumen which needed a amplex vascular plug. So this was the follow-up CT. The thoracic aortic part of the aneurysm is now completely dealt with. And uh, there is still aneurysm, I mean, uh, a dissection in the abdominal aorta, which may require attention later on, but right now it is uh, just being monitored. So to conclude, endovascular repair is said to become the dominant and favored treatment modality for all kinds of aortic pathology and in any part of the aorta. Perhaps the only place where surgery still has a dominant role is the ascending aorta, especially near the aortic root. And uh, our experience has shown that physician-modified fenestrated endografts, especially in the arch, are an effective, economical, and rapidly available alternative to commercially manufactured endografts. And uh, this has made a huge difference to our practice because uh, these are uh, available. We make them at a fraction of the cost of commercial fenestrated endografts, and these can be uh, made ready within a few hours as against six weeks or so to get a commercial in the graft. So thank you for your attention and I'll be very happy to take any questions that you may have. Professor George Joseph, we thank you for that very interesting and thought-provoking lecture. Um, I would like to ask your opinion when uh, in our setting, when we have patients who are hemodynamically unstable, who present with type B dissections, what is the place of doing an urgent percutaneous fenestration just to buy time before we have some definitive therapy for these patients? Yeah, so what, what you are probably referring to is fenestration of the flap the dissection yes. flap. Uh, so that is another uh, important uh, endovascular intervention in acute dissections where this uh, the intimal flap may be, like I showed you in one of my cases, 
the patient came with acute limb ischemia and the intimal flap had closed off the right uh, common iliac artery. So the first thing we had to do was to uh, pierce that uh, uh, intimal flap with a sharp wire and then put a stent into the right common iliac and restore flow down the right lower limb. Then only we could uh, work on the uh, aortic part of it. And uh, same thing may apply for uh, visceral ischemia. Sometimes the renal arteries may be occluded or the, there may be mesenteric ischemia, so the SMA may be occluded. So you may have to uh, penetrate these uh, intimal flaps and put small stents. The bare metal stents usually do into these target arteries. Very occasionally in the aorta itself, we may uh, penetrate a flap. Uh, and for that, we cross from the true to the false or false to the true uh, with a sharp wire and then ups uh, ups uh, scale it to a 035 stiff wire and then use a 20 millimeter balloon to make a, a rent in that flap. And that will then uh, allow flow down both sides of the flap. So that is, yes, a uh, very important thing in acute dissections who come with uh, visceral ischemia. Uh, Professor George, uh, it was a very interesting discussion. And uh, when do you think it's uh, unqualified for a procedure like, the, you know, going for a repair uh, with PCI or interventions and then giving it to a surgeon's to handle? Yes, so there are many situations where uh, surgery is the first uh, choice. So type A dissections for, for, uh, for one is basically surgical because the, the entry tear is in the ascending aorta. And so there is very little scope for endovascular treatment unless the endo, uh, entry tear is very close to the innominate artery and then you may be able to do an endovascular repair, but that's in the minority of cases. So most uh, type A dissections acute type A dissections are meant uh, to be treated by open surgery. And it has to be done very emergently because the mortality rate in type A dissections is something like 2% per hour. So the sooner you are able to get surgery done, the better. Then you have these uh, aneurysms of the aortic root, ascending aorta, which uh, again need surgery because there is no landing zone for endografts uh, uh, proximally. And then you have a very complex uh, kind of uh, aneurysms where the anatomy is not suitable for an endograft. Very recently we had a, a type B dissection with a very tortuous aorta and uh, we could not deliver the endograft uh, to through this that tortuosity and so finally we had to send the patient for surgery so anatomic uh, limitations uh, are another reason for uh, choosing surgery over endovascular repair and finally one would think of uh, economic reasons for in our country and perhaps in sri lanka as well uh, endographs are expensive and uh, especially if you make uh, if you are using commercially made uh, you know, this uh, uh, modified endographs, they're very expensive. So uh, only a minority of patients can afford uh, endovascular therapy, especially the complex ones. And so in those situations, again, the majority of patients will opt for open surgery. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yosef, uh, you know, I'm going back uh, again to the previous question uh, raised by Tanya. Um, when you're making a penetration, uh, what is the wire you use? Do you use the sharp end of the floppy wire or is, is there a special wire, right. you know, penetrated? Yeah, so I must clarify before I answer that uh, you are talking about penetration of the intimal flap, not penetration yes. of the endograft. So when yeah. you're uh, trying to make a fenestration in the intimal flap, uh, there are two or three techniques. Uh, one is you take a, a curved catheter. We often use the Judkins right six French and uh, orient it so that it's pointing towards the 
uh, false lumen. So you are coming up the true, pointing the catheter towards the false, and then you uh, pass a stiff wire through the flap, which is usually a CTO wire. And uh, there is one wire which is especially penetrative, which is called the Astato. It is made by Asahi, and uh, there is an Oven 8 and an Oven 4 version of it. The Oven 8 version has uh, got 30 grams tip strength, and it will then cross uh, into the false lumen. Then over that, you have to pass a balloon and then uh, progressively dilate, then change the wire to O35 and then dilate to 20 millimeter. Usually, what is the diameter of the balloon that you would pass through that? Yeah, so the you try to cross with the smallest balloon that you may have. So if it's an oven 4 system, you can use a coronary balloon to cross so that uh, you can make you a... Mean one millimeter first or one or two millimeter balloons or...? Yes, uh, 1.5 millimeter Ryujan is one of my favorites. Uh, okay. But any of those uh, very slick, uh, sleek balloons would work. Uh, the other technique is used to use... So is the that bronco. enough? Like small hole is enough? Do you have to put another balloon and make it bigger? Yes, yes. After? Uh, that is just to start. So once okay. the oven 4 or oven 8 wire is crossed from say true to false lumen, it may be very difficult to pass a large balloon. So first you pass a small balloon, make a small hole in it. Then you can pass a catheter and change the wire to 035 stiff wire, like an Amplac super stiff. Then you bring a big balloon. And finally we use a 20 millimeter balloon so that you make a, a large uh, fenestration in the flap. So these uh, tiny balloons are just to cross, because sometimes the intimal flap can be very thick and very difficult to cross. So first you may have to cross with a tiny balloon. Okay, and thank uh, you very so, much. So, th so sorry to interrupt, but in the interest of time, I think we have to close the session here. I want to thank you so much for such a wonderful, thought-provoking and interesting lecture. And we thank you on behalf of the Sri Lanka Heart Association. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.